Well, what an extraordinary conversation this has been with Dr. James Kelly from the United States to Australia, to the Middle East, to back here in the States, crossing the country to Bend, Oregon, to TEDx Talks, to writing a book called The Crucible's Gift. James has an extraordinary journey, and I know you're going to enjoy the discussion and be inspired by it. And I will say learn a lot. After all, he's taking leading psychological learnings and applying them within the flow of work. So when we talk about nudges, when we talk about showing up and being fully present and taking ownership of our own personal development, uh, this is what he focuses on day to day. So thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Dr. James Kelly. James, how you doing? Good, thanks, Al. I'm excited to be here, have a chat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been inspired by your work since the first time we met. So before we get into the discussion, if you would, introduce yourself a little bit and uh, what we're going to be talking about here today. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll give you the brief background before we d- go a little bit of a deeper dive off the 10 meter. So <laughs> I'm Dr. James Kelly, CEO of QChange and co-founder. And uh, Q Change was founded in, in 2019 while I was living in the Middle East. And so I'm an, a recovering academic, as you would say. Well, you're not only a recovering academic, you bring the science you know, of human behavior to a product that is very uh, inspiring. You talk about nudges, talk about getting your mind right. So yeah. if you would talk about your background educationally and what you were teaching before getting into product development and offering a solution. Yeah. So, I mean, I got to start off by saying just from the start, you know, I'm not, the, I'm not the smartest one on the team in the room. So you know, two other co-founders that are equally as smart and bring their own flavors as well. So to give them credit at the start. start. Um, you know, my background is consumer behavior. So I, I got my PhD in Australia um, at a considered Ivy League school there. And so I was very fortunate to go there. I lived in Perth for four years and I focused on really consumer behavior at a global level, looking at brands and perceptions around global brands on an eight country study. And so I did that for from 2010 to 2020, to be exact, where I taught in Australia, in Philadelphia, and in the Middle East uh, over that over that span. Wow. So that's what you were doing there. So before we get into yeah. all that, let's back up and say, Australia, how did you get there? Where, yeah. Did you grow up there? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Portland. So I always like to joke that I grew up in an Irish Catholic family, minus the Catholicism, but all the guilt that came with it. <laughs> Um, and so I grew up in a small 900 square foot house with six people. So pretty meager, um, lower middle class mom and dad, neither finished college. So I've grossly overachieved from the family <laughs> and education perspective. Um, yeah, but I just grew up in a small house, small family I had three older brothers. One was adopted and I was the youngest by five years. So I was kind of like that only child slash youngest child. So I have the great attributes of both of don't tell me what to do, but that's usually oldest and youngest. So it's kind of smashed together at one time. So in terms of uh, managing the energy in the room, you have a lot of experience from an early age, it sounds yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, especially at my house. Well, there's lots of, lots of energy. Not always positive, but lots of energy. So is that you graduated high school in the Portland area? Is that right? Yeah. So I went to this uh, school called David Douglas, and I was fortunate enough, you know, I wasn't a great student. And I didn't find this out till much later, probably 10 years later, that I I self-diagnosing that I probably had a learning disability. I couldn't retain what I read. Um, uh, I couldn't write well, things that make sense to me grammatically and spelling wise. And so I got pretty lucky. I played sports in college. And so I played water polo and I was able to go to a Midwest school. I wanted to be a big fish in a small pond. And there, you know, I had to go to remedial reading, remedial math. Like, I mean, I got in by the skin of my teeth. Um, mm-hmm. and it was mostly because the coaches begged um, and I got lucky. And so if, if I didn't get that break, I don't know where I would be right now as a human being. So, yeah. So I went there, went to University of Dayton in the Midwest from there. Wow. And so it sounds like the coaches were an inspiration or helped you through that experience. And would that be your team as well? Was there some kind of community that helped you along the way during that time, elevate your (laughs) confidence and awareness? You know, I think this is kind of where part of Q change comes from 
is the lack of that, the lack of awareness of what leadership means or how to teach someone to be better at leading. And, um, you know, I think often there's a, there's a mix up between what you say and what you do. And often people's words don't match behaviors. And so, you know, there were some really inspirational people that were teammates, captains, and the coaches were funny and fun, but they weren't always necessarily great at teaching you. I was a captain and then I was a coach. Actually, I was a player coach at one point. Um, it, do, it didn't, it wasn't helpful at times. Uh, it, what, you weren't taught when to be strong, when to listen, when to push, when to ask questions. And, you know, and leadership's evolved a thousand percent since, you know, the nineties in terms of what leadership really means. And so, you know, and you could probably chalk up to maybe I wasn't willing to listen. Maybe they Mm -hmm. did tell me, maybe I wasn't open to it. You know, that's also possible. So I think it's a really interesting question from your perspective. Well, you know, obviously those years are very formative and, Mm -hmm. you know, you have gone on to not only study psychology and human behavior, but you've now been in it for, you know, 20 plus years. So tell us, how did you go from Dayton, Ohio to Perth, Australia? What was the connective tissue there? Well, I think, I think you have to kind of almost back up a little bit and, um, you know, I grew when I grew up in my house. The only comment my parents ever had was try college, not go to college, not you'd be great at college, just try college. And so the bar was never really set particularly high for me. Um, I remember my mom and I had a conversation when I was older. I said, "Why don't you push me more academically?" And God bless my mom. Um, but her only response was, I was afraid you were going to turn to drugs. And I thought, well, you thought so little of me that I was going to like, like that, like what? So it was a little bit of a disconnect in terms of, uh, effort and reward in the house. And so I learned really young when to say I tried hard because then my parents would just leave me alone because mm. the theory is right, right? Like try hard. The process is what matter, not the results, but there was no accountability on the end of the try hard side of it. So is mm. try hard. Okay, you got a two four. Well, you're not very smart, probably, or you're not very good at school, you know. And that was the that was kind of the interpretation. So, from Dayton, Ohio, though, I mean, geez, Louise, we're talking about a train wreck of decisions from Dayton, Ohio. So, I, I went I went from Dayton to Chicago, and I lived a block from Wrigley Field after I graduated, and that was a fantastic experience. You could hear the roar of the crowd. You knew when it was a good game. You knew when it was a bad game by how drunk people were leaving the field um, in the stadium. And so, you know, and it was like the Blues Brothers where we lived right next to the L of the train. So we had the volume on the TV scheduled to go up every seven minutes and down every seven minutes. So and then back down again. So, you know, and and probably the final piece of that time in my life is that I literally had to scrape through the couches to find change to buy a dollar fifty hamburger once a week. So I was poor in a fun city. Uh. And I can't, can't reiterate enough. I was poor, so I couldn't have, <laughs> couldn't have fun. Um, and at the time, I was trying to get my master's in media management. So I thought I wanted to be a film producer. Um, but prior to moving to Chicago, my dad passed away in my third year of college. Mm. And they had moved from Portland after I graduated to Chicago briefly and then down to Atlanta for about nine months before he passed away. And so, you know, you talk about moments in your life that – you have choices. I probably about three of those big moments, maybe four, Mm -hmm. but that was one of those moments where I really had a choice to really fall off the face of the planet for a while. Um, Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you and your, your, your dad, um, but there's always that age where you kind of shift a little bit from father, son to more friends. And -hmm. we were starting to go through that phase where you stopped telling me what to do as much and more joking and things like that. And so, you know, it it was really difficult, sad, and also at the same time, uh, overwhelming to try to figure out how do you manage already being a bad student um, with the fact that drinking then became the center of what I was doing for about 12 months because that was a survival technique. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, you you do that. So me even graduating, by the way, was just like a stroke of hallelujah, Jesus, my mom. Um, and so, you know, you take that, you, and, and I think in that moment when my dad died, you know, after about, I don't know, probably 10 months, I was drinking quite a lot at the time. And part of that I think was being in college, but part of that definitely was a coping mechanism of like, okay, 
Um, but it became very clear that I had, a ch- had some choices upon reflection of, you know, my dad was the product of a, of a World War II dad. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine the harshness. My dad was a Vietnam dad. So there was a different set of harshness there. And so, you know, he Im- imbued this kind of sense of coldness at times and, and distance because that's what he had. And I really thought to myself, I don't want to replicate that. So what do I have to do to be more open, more vulnerable, more engaging, um, more of a hugger, you know, less of a handshaker, if you will. And so I think that kind of at, at 20, 21 really kind of started me on a different journey about personal growth. Mm-hmm. So to fast forward to Chicago, I was there nine months, but my mom was really struggling financially. And so she had moved back to the West Coast. And so I quit school and took a job um, opening an ad office for a national ad company. Totally oversold my abilities, like to the nth degree. Um, I used every ounce of charm I had in the bottle. And so I opened an office, uh, had no business being there. I had to find the staff, get the actual office, the furniture, the whole nine yards, sales, like everything. It was way over my head. Um, So yeah, I did that until 99 in December. And then I took another job down in San Jose and then I got fired. (laughs) So yeah, Um, but you know. I was okay with that. <laughs> Didn't really bother me. Um, <laughs> so you're uh, in San Jose by yourself. So you, you got your degree mm-hmm. from Dayton. Yeah. At yeah. this point. And you so bounced from Portland down to San Jose. Is that right? Portland to, yeah, yeah. So, so went to Dayton, Chicago, Chicago, Portland. Um, was in Portland for about 18 months. <clears throat> and then I bounced down to San Jose where I was there for uh, just shy of, I think, a year. Um, but I got fired. So I, I, I don't know if you remember Seinfeld, but that, 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 that summer of George, if you remember that episode, that was basically what I had was the summer of James where, um, I literally taught little kids how to swim in a pool. I grew a beard, had long hair down to my shoulders. I painted walls at a gym and I took six mile hikes every day. And that's all I did for about three months. And I, I don't, think I've ever been so relaxed. Uh, I don't take drugs. I'm not a drug person. I don't even smoke weed, but I can imagine that's how relaxed I probably was at that phase of my life. Uh, I remember being on the 680 and cars flipping me off because I was going 65. And I was like, hey, like just wave at them. And I was real happy. Anyhow. Um, that's crazy. And so, what year yeah, is this now? What was that? What year is this? Uh, we just crossed the millennial. So 2000. Okay. And then I All went right. to, from there, I actually moved to New York. So I thought I was going to coach water polo for a living. So there was a, a university who was starting a brand new program. And so I moved from San Jose, long hair, big beard to Staten Island, which every stereotype you probably can think of, I was the opposite of Staten Island, um, to a small liberal arts college to help them start a program. Did that for two years, realized I probably wasn't the best person for coaching, Um at least maturity wise. I, I think my prefrontal cortex wasn't quite developed at 27. I know I'm a little bit behind the curve on that. Uh, but while I was there in my second uh, year, I was getting my MBA. So I was able to get my MBA for free at this school and go through that process. But I took a water polo team to Australia. And that was my first time ever being abroad. So it was, a, it was a, all these college students from across the US. So I was the coach, took them to Australia. I was there for 10 days. And I was like, this is incredible. Koalas, <laughs> fruit bats, ocean. You know, we went to the um, Great Barrier Reef, and I'm like, I got to get out of America. So when I came back, I actually took a job teaching English in Japan. So, um, wow. so at 29, I moved from Staten Island to Tokyo, Japan, and I did that for a year, um, and that was hands down one of the most incredible years of my life in terms of just throwing yourself in the deep end of just a totally different culture, different language. You know, it's not even like going to Spain where the letters are at least the same. I mean, you're reading basically characters like you're watching the matrix and you're in the ship and you're watching the letters go up and down. I mean, that's what it felt like. And so, um, I did that for a year. And and I remember at 30 though, I called my mom from a phone booth, like just crying. I turned 30. I was like crying, mom, I'm just such a waste. I don't know what I'm doing. And my mom doesn't give great advice, but this was like her best advice ever. And I'm going to paraphrase for the audience, but she was like, shut the F up. You have your whole life in front of you, suck it up and move back and move on. I was like, okay, mom, okay, that sounds good. You know, like, so 
So um, I moved back uh, when I had just turned 30. So I moved back at 30. And I was another one of those pivotal points in your life. And so I was applying for the Peace Corps and I got into the Peace Corps. And I was working at a software company as a contractor doing cold calls all day long to, to government agencies. Um, and I just cold call, try to get them in the sales funnel and all that stuff. But I, I was trying to decide Peace Corps. And so I went to a Peace Corps event down at Portland State. So I moved back to Portland where my mom was at. And I was cool. I was 31 living in with my mom. I mean, I was really rocking the, the social life at that point. <laughs> and so I um, was at this Peace Corps event. And I remember so vividly. After the event, the woman that was hosting it, I sat with her and had some beers and her friends who were from Africa came and were getting their PhD at, at Portland State, came and sat down. We we're all having a conversation about economics and politics of Africa. And I was holding my own. And I was like, oh, well, these guys are all PhDs and I could talk with them. Why can't I do that? And so I started basically looking at universities and I didn't want to go to the US. So I started looking at universities in Spain, in the UK, in Ireland. Um, and then in Australia. And so um, I applied to all these schools and I got into a couple in the UK. I'm like, ah, it's too rainy there. I really don't want to go there. Um, I got into Spain. I thought, man, I just learned Japanese. I can't even fathom trying to learn another language right now. And so uh, when I was looking at Australia, the, <laughs> this is the stupidest reason to move there. Um, the, the, I moved to Perth and the school I applied to is what's called a group of eight, which is one of their Ivy League schools there. And it's in Perth called University of Western Australia. And I remember the fact that really stood out to me is that it's the most isolated capital city in the world. And I was like, oh, that would be really cool to go there and live in the place that's most isolated. Now, I don't know if that was kind of an internal metaphor of I want to get away from everything. Um, but anyhow, so that was my selection criteria is, oh, it's pretty far away and it's sunny. And to give the audience kind of a, a sense of what it was like. It's San Diego in Australia. Right. So it's right on the beach. Um, beautiful weather most of the time. It does rain a bit more, but it's just absolutely stunning. The water's stunning. Um, yeah. And just good human beings. So that's how I got to Australia. My, my life is not linear. There's nothing no. linear about my life. No, I don't know too many linear lives. I don't know what one yeah. looks like. <laughs> there was one, but yeah, you were talking about going uh, down under. And that's uh, you, you can't get too much further away. So now you're in Perth, and I imagine you selected the program prior to getting in. Is that right? Correct. 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 Yeah, yeah. And what drew you to that uh, that uh, course of study? Well, you know, it was interesting when I first started. So there were two things about that I really liked. Um, one. Their program was more in line with the U.S. PhD programs, where the first year is all coursework to mm -hmm. kind of get yourself around the math, the science, and all that stuff. That's not common in most, um, at least it wasn't when I was there, common with most PhD programs. Typically, outside the U.S., they say, okay, you're going to get your PhD, and they drop you in, and you got to sort it all out. How are you going to do your methods? How are you going to do the research? And so mm -hmm. it's a much more complicated in a lot of PhDs outside of the U.S., and most people struggle because they don't really know what to do. So mm -hmm. I like that from that capacity. But when I started, my focus actually was on leadership. Um, and, and so it was I was looking at this, this theory called attribution theory. Basically what it is is why people make excuses for events that happen, <clears throat> make attribution. And I was looking at basketball coaches' attribution theory around why they play – why they play players pay, – sorry, why they play – players, that's really hard to say, um, who are high salary versus those that are low salaried. But if you look at stats, they're equal. So what's mm -hmm. the attribution and justification of that? So I started with that as my, as my initial, um, I think, strain of, of, of focus was this management. But my, my advisor left. And in fact, he left to go be the head to build the, the Dubai indoor ski um, at the Dubai <laughs> mall, ironically. Um, and so he left. And so at the same time, my really good friend who I was getting my PhD with, um, he was also roughly my age. He said, have you thought about marketing? And I'm like, well, I liked marketing. And so that was like a pivot of, I can still do psychology leadership, but I can do it in marketing around the consumer, not the leader. So my mm -hmm. initial intent was leader. And then I kind of moved into the psychology side of the consumer, which is super interesting. If you go to a grocery store or any of that stuff, it's all psychology. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, so now you switched yeah. to marketing. Yeah. Was there a, a goal in mind? Did you want to get a job <laughs> in that afterwards? I mean, what, what happened there? 
Yeah. Is there ever a goal in mind? Um, <laughs> so I think I never saw myself as an academic. Uh, I saw myself as at the time I saw myself as someone trying to prove the world wrong. Hmm. So, you know, my impetus for going down that path was to kind of give the big middle fingers to anyone who thought I was stupid. It's not the right reason, not even trying to justify it, but that was my motivation during that time of like, okay, everyone around me always thought I was really dumb because I wasn't good at reading and I wasn't good at in, in, um, holding on to that data in my head. You know, I wasn't great at writing. And so the assumption was always oh, not very bright. But when I got my MBA, what was really clear is any of the practical stuff, I was just spot on, like really quick, really good in intuition. And so the PhD was really about me proving to the world that I was smart. Now, the irony is that the world doesn't give two SHs <laughs> about my smarts whatsoever. Um, but at the time, boy, I bet everybody did in my mind. So mm -hmm. uh, that was my driver. But with that, you know, I was almost done. I got married, had my first kid, moved countries. And I thought, okay, well, academia is a very safe, um, very flexible. It's almost like if you're really good at academia, you see it all the time with the Adam Grants. It, it's it basically a mini entrepreneurship world if you have a safe space. And so I thought I, I would love to do that. So that's why I went down the academic route and then I moved to Philadelphia to teach marketing at St. Joe's University in 2009. Nine, I think it was. And I hadn't finished my degree yet. So I was still working. It's called ABD All But Done. And so uh, I wasn't done yet. I started a new job teaching, had a second child. And every weekend I would work 20 hours on my PhD for the first 10 months I was there um, to finish the PhD. It, it was an insane time. Like it was an obscene amount of work. Oh, gosh. And yeah. you're raising two kids now. It's yeah. like, Which tells you amazing. how great my wife is, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so take us from there. I mean, this is fascinating because it is providing, because much of this, for the record, I'm hearing for the first time as well. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just like, I'm starting to connect some dots with some of the narrative that you have mm. since put forth and, and some of what's happening with QChain. So, mm. okay, you're teaching St. Joe's, you have a couple kids, you know, where do you go yeah. from there? Well, two more kids after that is where I went from there. Um, so I didn't know where to stop. Uh, so, you know, I want to tell you like, a really interesting story that happened in Australia that I think would help maybe project a little bit. When I moved there, you know, I, I'd done this exercise where I wanted to write down goals that 10 years down the road. And I'm not the best at writing goals. I can acknowledge that. But I did this exercise and I wrote down 10 goals. And every goal was based on either five or 10 years out. And it was based on as if I did it. So, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I published an article in a top five academic journal, right? I consulted for a fortune 500 company and I wrote it and by a date, and then I wrote the steps that I had to do and accomplish to achieve that goal. Um, and so I said, you know, I did this, I did that all action-based already done past tense. And I think the fascinating thing is I, I wrote that, I put it away and I have a really bad short-term memory for things like that and forgot about it. One of, the, one of the goals was I had a family of four. One of the goals was I wrote a book by 45. One of the goals was academic journal. Consult, and I, did, I went back and I found the, the booklet and I achieved eight of the 10 goals in the time frame that I put down in that book. Just super wow. fascinating because some people look at them all the time and I'm, I'm just really bad about it and I didn't do it. But the action of doing it, as if you did, as if you had done it, was fascinating. So, in in St. Joe's, several of those goals were, you know, um, get in an academic journal that's top five. Did that, and so I spent I spent seven years there teaching, but I didn't get tenure, and so there comes a decision point, um, and I know why I didn't get tenure because my entrepreneurial side was going crazy, and I was trying to do all these side gigs. And I wasn't fully solely focused on writing articles all the time. Mm -hmm. And so at the time of tenure, I had three academic articles, two were top tier, one wasn't, and I had two under review. And if those two were accepted, I would have gotten tenure for sure. Um, and so the irony is, is that on my way to the airport, taking 25 grad students to Milan and Barcelona, they call me and they tell me, you didn't get tenure. I'm taking these kids overseas. Lucky I brought them all back. Um, <laughs> and then, and then after I quit the job or got fired, essentially, 
uh, June that year, after we had decided to move overseas, both those articles got accepted at top tier journals. So oh, I wow. would have been able to maintain tenure. I would have got tenure if I would have done that. Um, but totally fine. I think that's how life works itself out. So um, while I was there, I spun up a couple of well-being ideas. I had a well-being podcast. I moved to a leadership podcast. Um, I did the leadership podcast from 2015 to 18, where it was called Executive After Hours. I care about what you, who you are, not what you do, because who you are will define what you do. Mm-hmm. So very similar to this format, lots of journeys and things like that. So really fun for me. And I got to play armchair psychologist before Dax <laughs> Shepard really made it mainstream. So that was fun. Um, and then when we moved to the Middle East, it was just another crazy you know, event with four kids and a wife in the middle of the desert. So, <laughs> wow, man, this is book worthy. I mean, I know you have a book, but this is certainly the, the autobiography. Yeah. We, this is, could be the cliff notes for it, um, <laughs> although it's still being written. Um, yeah. So now you're in the Middle East. Yeah. yeah. What, what took you there? So my same best friend from my PhD who told me to switch to marketing had moved there to teach at a university. And he asked me the year before you should move. I'm like, no, I do not want to go to the Middle East. Like in my head, I had all this perception of the Middle East. And he's Australian. And and Tim was like, no, no, it's super safe. There's no problems. And he explained why it's safe and why no one would ever do terrorist attacks in this in Dubai or UAE. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So when I didn't get tenure, I was like, well, we want our kids to live abroad at some point. So this might be the best opportunity to do it. And you really can't get any different than the US than going to the Middle East, besides maybe going to Asia. So the two really big opposites there. So um, I ended up going to this town called Alain, A-L space A-I-N. It's on the Omani border, all the way in from Mm -hmm. Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and spent four years teaching there. Um, Incredible experience, incredible uh, place to learn about various cultures. So our friends were, like, I'll give you an example of my kids' classes. Um, They had... um, the Irish, Scottish, British, Spanish, French, Greek, Jordanian, Egyptian, South Korean, uh, Polish, Emiratis, uh, Saudis, and probably Moroccan in there as well. That would be their class makeup. Wow. Right. And within their class, they had shake and shake us. So they had prince and princesses in their class as well. So it was just really eclectic learning for my kids that culture is is big it's diverse yeah. it's not yeah. white my my daughter my youngest daughter was the only caucasian in her class wow right so when we moved back she we, she was 5 and i remember her first day of school she goes to to mary my wife mom why does everybody look like me like it was just didn't she didn't understand why everybody looked the exact same as her the yeah. other, the other big thing that was really powerful and it really got me teary eyed was my older daughter, Lucy, we were sitting at a table. I think she was eight at our, at our kitchen table. And she's like, dad, I don't really understand why people hate other people because they have different religions. And I was just like, I'm done. Like if, if that's what she gets out of life is like, it's only a title, the, it's the human being that matters. Then man, I, my, my wife and I have done our job. Like our kids are good kids. So absolutely. So it was a really good experience. And then um, while I was there is where I wrote my book. So I wrote the book um, and I, it was it was a really. The cru- Crucible Skip. Yeah. yeah, the Crucible. Thank you. I forgot the name. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, that would actually be hilarious if I did forget the name, by the way. Um, God, it was the only book I wrote. I don't know what it is. It's um, something. It's something. It's something gift. <laughs> Sam's gift? No, no, that's not it. Um, but but that book was actually cathartic for me. And so the book is really about being authentic and taking your adversity and how do you make that and help that speed up your ability to be more authentic as a human being. And so as an academic, I come up with a framework and all that stuff. But what was more impactful was the 120 interviews I did to get the content for the book. Um, and what was even more fascinating is I wrote it in six weeks in Portugal. So we went to Portugal for the summer. I sat in a coffee shop every day. The kids went to the beach and played in the waves and I would type and I had a format and this is for your audience. Anyone thinking about writing a book? What I did is I, I, um, on Monday I would do research all day long and I would speed read books or put them on audio two times and take notes and the theme of the chapter. 
I'd create an outline on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon, my wife would interview me. I'd make an outline with questions. So what did I answer the question? She said, what do you mean by this? And I would expand. Can you tell me more about that? And I'd expand Wednesday night. I would transcribe it Thursday and Friday. I would write the whole chapter. And I did that in six straight weeks. And I had my first manuscript to the editors at the end of the summer. And then it was the editing process from there. Um, So very tight, meaningful, um, fast process where I was digesting a lot of content, probably too fast. Um, But, you know, got it done. Yeah, Yeah. you got it over the finish line. I was just going to say that's that's remarkable. And the essence of the the book, I mean, you touched on it, but yes, some of the chapters and what you uh, wanted to inspire with the reader. So, I mean, I think the, the thing I'm most proud about it, honestly, not only just finishing a book in general, like that, that, and by the way, that was one of my goals is to write a book by 45. And so I did this at 46. I was a year late on it. Um, um, <laughs> but the other thing I'm, I'm really proud about is that Dr. Marshall Goldsmith and Bill George, who are two leadership gurus, both endorsed the book. Now, that only means a thousand people read it, but nonetheless, two <laughs> people that are really important did endorse the book. So I know it's not totally crap. Um, no. So, so the essence of the book really is this notion of um, the authentic leadership model. And so when you think about these leaders that I interviewed, and these are from Google executives to entrepreneurs and everything in between, it really starts with the notion of, of, okay, how do you take your adversity and what do you do with it? And once you've embraced it, you know, kind of moving these concepts that it happened to me versus for me, right? Mm-hmm. So most people say it happened to me, not for me. And when you make that shift, it really changes the, the chemicals in your brain in terms of how you're interpreting that event, right? Mm. And what I found is that those that move from the from the to me to for me um, had a much better self awareness of themselves, their gaps, their challenges, their strengths. Um, it allowed them to be more compassionate to those around them who went through something similar or tangential. It allowed them to really value the relationships and foster those in a much deeper level. And it allowed them to live with more integrity. Like I've been through it. I've got my scars. Um, but, but what I found is kind of the overarching thing is that you could have the worst, you know, poo sandwich ever. But if you don't have a growth mindset, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're mm-hmm. not going to become more self-aware or value those relationships. Um, and, and, you know, I, I found both of those in my research. You know, those who never went from the four to two or sorry, the two to four, um, and they just kind of like, no, I'm happy. I have no regrets. I think everything's great. And da da da. And I'm just like, you're 65. There's got to be a regret in your life. Like one regret. Oh, you know, that I didn't go to my son's fifth birthday. Okay. Glad that was your biggest issue your whole entire life. That's not <laughs> normal. Like that is not a normal journey in someone's life. So anyhow, so yeah. that was kind of the essence of it is kind of walking you through these different steps and what it looks like. And um, I use a combination of, of research my story, and then the, the interviews I did. And the written book is very Malcolm Gladwell-esque in the sta- and the audio si- on the audio side, sorry, the audio book. Before Malcolm Gladwell, again, I'm ahead of the curve, uh, <laughs> before Dak Shepard, before Malcolm. And so I actually had authors, um, uh, actors act out the different people and I interviewed and across the book. So oh. it's like this multidimensional um interaction, if you will, in terms of the different interviews I did and the parts they have in the book and their voices are all different. And so it's, it's really cool from that perspective. Oh, well, we're going to have to put the links uh, in, yeah. the, in the description so that people can go listen to that. Um, so at this point, you're still teaching, though, in the Middle uh-huh. East. And uh, have you toggled to teaching leadership? Or are you still in nope. marketing at this stage? Still straight up consumer behavior. Uh-huh. So the gateway drug was the podcast, if you want to use that terminology. Because yeah. you know, uh, uh, here's, here's the thing. And I, and I feel, and it is, um, leadership is hard. And I had felt when I started the podcast that I, I didn't know my head from a hole in the ground on how to lead. And I still don't think I do. I'm still figuring it out as I go. Um, and so I was really curious uh, around how, how individuals used their adversity to be a better leader. Um, and so that was really my, my jumping off point to leadership was this process. I've always been fascinated by it. I've always struggled to probably exude some of the attributes, some I have really good, charismatic, good listener. Um, you know, I'm great at apologizing. Like I always apologize to the team. 
Um, and there's some areas I struggle. Like I'm, you know, as an academic, you're kind of an individual. You kind of do your own thing. So sometimes team playing, I struggle with a little bit, you know, from the standpoint of, oh, I got this, I'll do it. And then, you know, versus slow it down and get everyone's voices in the room. And, you know, and I understand the value of it, but my, my behavioral history is go fast, do it on your own. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, learnings I wanted to, to grab from these interviews from a leadership perspective, but I was teaching marketing at that time. And, and it was incredibly interesting because I would teach on, on two different sides of the campus, a female side and a male side. And it was divided by a wall all the way through campus. And you'd have a special badge to get to one side to the other. And, you know, so you really see this bifurcation of societal norms in real time. Um, and so that was really fascinating. Wow. I bet. So you're here. When did you do the podcast? Were you still in the Middle East when you're doing the podcast? And when did you, you know, make the jump to focus on leadership? And mm-hmm. I want to also make sure that we talk about your uh, talk on questions to ask. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the podcast was 2015 to 18. I was living in Philadelphia and I'd moved to the Middle East um, and I did it for another year and a half, year and a bit, but it was really challenging. So uh, I'm sure you know this, I, you know, you have your wish list of guests and then you kind of just, who wants to talk at some point, right? And, you know, I may fall into who wants to talk at some point, uh, but that's kind of where I was getting to. Whoever would come to me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's easier than me going out to find the creme de la creme. Um, and in the US, it was easier to find that because I was in US time zone. It doesn't look as weird as some guy in the Middle East reaching out. Hey, let's talk. So, so what I realized is the quality of the guests I were getting, and I could be your your down point right now, was getting less. And so, and so I did. This, and so I just decided that it wasn't. I wasn't giving my all, and the content I was providing or creating was no longer good. I found myself at the forty five minute zone a point, like Googling stuff and, <laughs> you know, like, and I, and I, so it was just a signal of like, I'm not that into it anymore. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so that was kind of my, let's cut it off at that point. That was 2018. So 2018. So where does Q change? Yeah. Into so, and how, and how did you connect with your co-founders? I imagine yeah. that's there as well. Yeah. So Q change, um, first of all, is a fancy British, you know, culmination of letters is what I ended up doing because all our friends were British. So I took the idea of Q, like Q up a change, Q up, um, prompt that idea and then put it with Q change. But it was really launched in the notion initially as a wellness solution. And so the big idea I had at the time was using these things called beacons. So they're little, they're about the size of like probably your, your iPod case and you put them inside organizations inside the building And it's Bluetooth created. And so if they have their app, it would send nudges to them to do certain things. Take the stairs, not the elevator. Eat the salad, not the hamburger. um, Have a healthy conversation. But it was using geolocation inside the organization to essentially drive better behaviors. And that was the starting point. Um, And so I had a research grant from the university. I went and um, found a company, created the app, tried it out. And it worked okay And in fact, I was in conversations with the Expo 2020 to use the solution to drive nudges and behaviors at the Expo event. And for the audience, you know, you think about the World Fair, this was what they were hosting. They were hosting it in Dubai um, in 2021 or 2020, whatever, whatever year COVID hit, they pushed it back another year after that. Um, But I was in conversations with them around driving this experience, but I was too small didn't have you know the the financial backing to really make it work, but there was interest in that moment. So I went from there and I put um, an ad on AngelList, um, which is a very common site for startup founders and, and companies. And in 2018, we flew, we flew back to the states as a family, and we drove 7,534 miles in a Ford Explorer with a family of six from 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 Philadelphia to DC, to St. Louis, to Chicago, to Denver, to um, Calgary, to BC, Vancouver, BC, to Seattle, to Portland, to Bend, Oregon, and then back to Seattle again and flew out. Um, And so um, we came through Bend 
and my my wife's brother had just moved here. Uh, my wife's from the Midwest, but he had just moved here. And so we came through and I said, this is where we're going to move. She's like, oh, I don't know. Da, da, da. And after like the third day, she's like, nope, I get it. And so we knew at that point we wanted to move. So fast forward to the co-founders. I put an ad on Angel's List looking for a co-founder, uh, CTO. And Rob reached out and Rob is one of the co-founders. He was based in Bend or is based in Bend. And was a 20-year executive at Intel and was looking to do a startup. And so he reached out and, he, and he's more COO-ish, not CTO, CTO-ish. Um, but I thought, hey, I don't know anything about anything. So that would work as well. And so that was kind of the start. And so for the first year, I lived in the Middle East. He lived in, in Bend as we were building the product and the experiences. And then we added Dr. John Howes there shortly after. And John was a senior consultant at Conexa before that slowly died um, mm-hmm. and left there. And he also didn't want to go work for a big company. He wanted to do something kind of small. So he came on board about four or five months later after we founded the company. So we've kind of been going ever since then as a team. And so in 2020, which if you want another great story, I can tell you about moving in the middle of COVID from the Middle East to Bend, Oregon at the start of COVID. um, We moved from Dubai or from outside Dubai to Bend um, in a trip that normally takes 22 hours, took us 43. Um, Again, just to reiterate, a family of six. <laughs> yeah, the youngest was five. So yeah, that's a yeah. hero's journey right there. I, yeah. I can't. I mean, that's its own podcast. I imagine. That's 43 <laughs> hours and, oh my gosh, six. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, obviously you made it. And mm. yeah, I had hair point. before we started the journey, though, Al. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're in Ben finally. And is it still a wellness nudge based app or when did you toggle over to? Yeah. Oh, great wellness? question. So um, probably right as we launched the company, Rob went out to his network, kind of asked, would you want to have some sort of beacon type technology in your company? And 90% were like, we don't want to add any infrastructure in our building. And I don't think they fully understood it was, it's a small thing, but mm-hmm. that was kind of a signal of, okay, that's probably not going to work. But what can we do to create nudge experiences? Because for me, nudge theory is really important. And so the conclusion was, well, we can use a calendar. And so now we move from health and wellness to a leadership model to in real time, nudge, measure, and grow leadership behaviors in the flow of work. And then the big question was, do you do that in a separate app or do you do that in existing solutions? And so we decided to do existing solutions inside Microsoft Teams. Um, At the time we made that decision, Microsoft Teams had 25 million users, Slack had 12, fast forward COVID, Microsoft has 270 million users, and I believe Slack has about 40 or 45 at this point. So totally, if you watch the the graph, it just, Microsoft goes like this and Slack is kind of like that. So, So it was a smart decision, but again, there's huge challenges that we have going down that path. It's mostly enterprise, much slower sales cycle, things like that. Right. And is it, you know, go through the core value proposition. You mentioned nudges. You, you've used yeah. the term beacon a couple of times. Uh, what's yeah. the experience look like? Yeah. So if you think about the value proposition, the best way I explain it, Al, is I can only imagine how many times you've been asked questions like, uh, hey, Al, are you a good strategic thinker? Are you inclusive? Are you, you know, direct and to the point? And whenever someone asks you that question, the inevitable response is almost 90% of the time in a workforce. Yes. Right. And so it's an, it's an, it's a subjective question. Right. And so the value proposition is we take these notions of soft skills and we provide an objective measure of that leader soft skill in the flow of work in real time. And so there's a lot of value when you think about it from a psychological perspective. We tend to live in this world of what's what I term ideal self and actual self. And so ideal self is how you see yourself, what you want to be like. I used to have a slide when I would teach this in marketing and it would be, it would be um, the ideal self would be Ryan Reynolds would be my ideal self. And then the picture would be me, the actual self, right? And so what happens is that if you don't have that accountability of actual self, there's usually a gap. And so what we've done is created an accountability loop through soft skills to say, okay, if I think I'm a strong communicator, what do those around me see? Right. And often what we find out is there's a gap either way. Like for women, it's usually they rate themselves lower than men. I'm a white, I'm a white male. I'm probably going to rate myself higher than most. 
That's that history and science says that. So we're really allowing people to say, how do I really show up in targeted meetings that match the behaviors you're working on? So to reiterate that, the value proposition is really around us being able to measure and grow culture change through leadership development and the flow of work focused on soft skills. Well, let's um, go a little bit deeper too, because I like I've seen the product we've sure. gone you know, you know through it. Yeah. So if I'm listening, I'm like, okay, that's interesting, but what does that actually look like? Look and like. just to frame it a little bit, you know, I'm in a 50 meeting after you and I talked, and yeah, you know, there's some, been some other inspirations. Like I I try and book 50 minute meetings so I can have transitions. Yeah. from the experience and into the next experience. And mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, it bumps up just because that's how life is. But I try, again, with your inspiration as being mm-hmm. you know, something that has guided my thinking on this is like, I need to land the plane from the pe- previous 50 minutes or however long <laughs> it was. And I need to get mentally ready for the, the next experience. So, you know, with that as a staging, you know, how does Q change work? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think there are, there are a couple of different secret sauces, if you will. The first one is our lead model, which is 45 different soft skills. So any leadership competency you can think of, we probably covered across our 45 areas. So we have something for anybody who's working on something in their journey. So kind of that customiz- customizability of what you want to work on when you want to work on it. The second thing is that um, we think that nudge intentionality is critical. So one of our bits of secret sauce is that we can figure out The area you're working on, so let's say the behavioral area you're working on is strategic thinking. And what our solution does is we look for those meetings where strategic thinking would most likely come into play. Strategy meetings, planning meetings, maybe some even governance meetings. And so we then match the behavior you're working on to that meeting type to send you a nudge to focus on that area. And that's important to center in you to say, okay, here's what I need to work on. Here's what I said I'm going to work on. Really important. So that's the first psychological bit of the puzzle, if you will. The the second bit of the puzzle is the immediacy of feedback. We hear a lot. I mean, if you read anything from um, Josh Burson, like the article just came out in the flow of work, Mm -hmm. right? And there's a huge movement in the flow of work and that context matters. And so what we've done is said, well, the context of this meeting is strategy. So we're going to send you a strategy meeting. And in the flow means, well, how did I do on that behavior in the flow of work? So after the meeting, we ask you, the leader or user, anyone can be a leader in our book. um, Did you act with strategic thinking? We ask it on a scale of one to five and you give yourself maybe a four. But at the same time, we ask those individuals that are in the meeting that you've invited, did you see James act with strategic thinking in this meeting? And so the important thing is you're getting that real time context accountability loop around your behavior you're focused on. You know, the the value proposition that's much different than traditional feedback solutions is how did James do in the meeting? It's very open and that's important, right? But if I'm working on one specific skill, I should want to know about that skill that I'm working on, not not the other stuff. That's a different meeting maybe. And so with that, that's the immediacy factor. And so when you look at a learning model, we move from in the classroom experience where retention is only about 10 or 15% after seven days to an experiential learning, which the retention is about 75% after after 75 days. So we're creating these real-time micro experiences. Now, the last bit though, which I think is really, really critical in terms of a psychological journey perspective, and I kind of get on my high horse a little bit here, so please kick me off it if you want. No, keep um, going. Is this idea of gratitude. We know there's a huge movement in the organization. And so there's this theory of reciprocity or cycles of giving. And so we feel that when someone provides you feedback, written feedback, which we call observations, because you can't argue with what you see, right? So we call it observations. When someone gives you that as a leader, if I get it from you, Al, I don't know it's you. And just so the audience knows, the, the quantitative data is aggregate and anonymous. The qualitative data is aggregate and anonymous. And so if, Al, you give me feedback and your observation one, I can say, oh, that's really helpful. By a click of a button, I can send you gratitude back. And why that's really valuable from a cycle of giving standpoint is you've given me time and energy to give me feedback, and I've given you appreciation on that feedback, bringing your voice into that cycle of giving. And so it's a really powerful um, set of psychological tools, nudge theory. Just to back up on that, um, I'm going to get on even a, probably a higher horse just really quick. Get up um, there. I get really, f- I don't know if frustrated is the right word. Um, perturbed maybe, uh, it, when people say they use nudges, if you, if you really want a nudge to work, it needs to be tethered to a behavior you're trying to practice. 
immediately before that behavior. So a lot of solutions out there do a great job sending you nudges, which are really reminders. Hey, we noticed you haven't talked to this group over here. Go have a conversation. Hey, we noticed this person's productivity is going down. Have a conversation. Really important, like not minimizing that. But when we're talking about individual behaviors that you want to practice, there's a reason why in the grocery store that candy bars and Cokes and magazines and batteries are the checkout counter because your intent in that moment is to buy. Hmm. So the reason why we use nudges immediately before a meeting is that your intent is to show up in that meeting to practice that behavior. And so that tethering together is really critical from a nudge theory perspective. Um, The last thing I'll say about our solution, which I think is really impactful, is there are 30 plus years of research on self-determination theory. And it's an intrinsic motivation theory. And what it says is that when an individual has autonomy, mastery, and basically relationships, they're intrinsically motivated to act, to do. So we give you the autonomy to invite who you want to invite to help you grow and select what you want to select. We give you the mastery to practice those skills that you're trying to practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we give you the relationships by letting your team engage in providing you real-time feedback. And so in healthy ecosystems, that's a thriving environment for the leaders and the teams. Yeah, I, congratulations for what you've achieved in this because it is reminding me of a quote from the late great John Wooden, he was UCLA basketball coach. And it's, it's not what you teach. It's what you emphasize. Mm. And this aligns with, you know, Charles Duhigg's the power of habit Mm. and we all Mm. are well-intentioned, but how do we consciously create these ways of being these habits within the flow of work? So not only are we better collaborators and better workers, but we feel better about ourselves that we Mm. have the growth that we are are, are seeking. So, Mm. you know, with that, in mind, what are some of the barriers to this actually happening in organizations? Does it take a new level of discipline? Does Mm. space need to be created to answer these questions? You know, how does that work? Yeah, great question. I think, first of all, you know, in innovation, and you know this probably all too well, first is getting past the initial, I think, external pressure of doing what's always worked though there's no evidence that it works. Mm -hmm. So it's getting past that traditional thinking and and getting them to understand this evolution is really impactful in conjunction. So one of our go-to-market strategies is with coaching companies and Mm -hmm. coaches are really important, but ask any coach, they have no idea what happens between sessions, zero, Mm -hmm. right? And so our, our largest partner is a coaching company out of Australia and we just launched with a global toy manufacturer. They're running with them. They're running a leadership development program with them as part of their coaching business. And so we're the follow-on effect. Hey, we just spent you know three days doing this stuff. Let's make it stick, right? And so um, from that perspective, it's super valuable. But the challenge is getting people to shift um, from what was to what could be. That's, that's the first major shift. Uh, the second major shift, I think, barrier to entry, um, like any SaaS platform, is you got to deal with IT. So it's a mm-hmm. very long process. You got to have all the documents, everything set up. Um, but I think the third one is people being vulnerable. So I take the mm-hmm. IT, let's throw the IT out of that. From the human side, being vulnerable. You know, I think trusting that there's nobody utilizing this data for anything other than good. Right. The data we capture at scale, you know, we've done the data flywheel metric. And as we scale, we can start capturing trillions of data points on human behavior in the flow of work, trillions Mm -hmm. across the world um, Mm -hmm. around specific areas of what's driving growth. And so the people that use our solution are always and often who's going to see this data, who has access to it, how can they utilize it? And so there's there's kind of this this need to comfort them that it's a development tool first and foremost. And the minute it becomes a selection tool, we're probably going to lose some efficacy and usage on that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really clear about we're a development tool for organizations. Now, if they're looking for verticals, levels in the organization where there's strength in leadership, not leaders, but in leadership, we can then give them that information. They can go do their own due diligence in that area, what's working, what's not working. At least today, that's our stance. Um, if someone gave us $10 million tomorrow, we might sw- shift that stance. I'm, stance. I'm kidding, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so and so that's another barrier. I mean, it's a great question now. I think as any startup, 
it, it's the, there's the marketing barrier, there's the product barrier, there's the uh, adoption innovation barrier. So there's always always barriers as an early stage company of saying, okay, what's the hurdle we have to jump over today to get to tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, you know, there's always a hurdle. There's always a barrier. Well, there's always a hurdle, and there's always there's this pull of the future, if you will, because uh, mm-hmm. you know, as we you know start to wrap up, we've probably got ten minutes or so. Okay. Uh, you know, let's talk about the future of leadership, the future of work, uh, because yeah. we're in this hybrid reality where, yeah, people are, are going to work from home, depending mm-hmm. on you know the job, family, and industry, probably in perpetuity. And we're redesigning homes where our interactions are different, more meetings, uh, mm-hmm. the space to get work done in many cases is reduced. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have to be more empathetic. We're talking about gratitude, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So all these leadership behaviors that are deemed to be worthwhile to improve upon are there. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the the research is, is there. The ability to actually do that at scale is really difficult to your point you, you what are people supposed to watch a video and all of a sudden they're magically changed you know that's yeah, not yeah. going to happen so as we go to the future mm. as i listen to you mm. i'm like you know this is going to be part of the process it, it has to be you, you mm. know if not q chains then, then something like it mm. again i'm probably you know throwing you a softball here but <laughs> But I'm actually going to flip the question. You know, in the absence of this, you know, how are leaders going to hold themselves accountable? How are they, how are they going to have that autonomy and mm-hmm. mastery and and these relationships? I, I don't see it unless it's something mm-hmm. like this. Well, I, I think the question you're asking, and more importantly, the future of work is how can leaders know how they're doing day to day without seeing the person face to face? Yeah, like there's no quick, easy way to have those water pool water cooler conversations. You know, even if we go to a hybrid and people are coming in, you know, Tuesday, Thursdays or whatever they settle on, um, there's still the other 30 meetings you have during the week. And, and to be clear, our solution doesn't nudge every meeting. It's morning and afternoon. It's targeted. You know, it's, it's enough to be impactful, not too much to be annoying. Um, it's the balance we, we've kind of committed to. Um, but I think the future of work to me in, in the absence of this, and you see it in the data, this, this leadership skills gap, like every CEO is concerned about how do we upskill our leadership down the organization? And how can we do it at scale and not spend tens of million dollars, tens of millions of dollars on these individualized leadership programs, which are important. I don't ever want to minimize that because these are our partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, but time is not scalable. Software is scalable. Okay. So time is meaningful and impactful and should be targeted. But if you're trying to scale, we see our solution being the solution that's being used where organizations can see where their strengths are and weaknesses are by department, vertical, and level. And then they can do much faster remediation or replication of the areas that are, that are doing great or areas that are struggling a little bit. And it's giving them that insight in the flow of work on a daily basis to say, hey, our marketing department's thriving, but man, our finance department's really struggling. We got to go investigate this. But mm-hmm. here's the other thing now that I think, you know, one of our advisors is, a, is the former CHRO of Lincoln Financial. Mm-hmm. Um, and where she sees this adding a ton of value from the C-suite perspective is that every time CHRO has to write a human capital report for the annual report, it's pretty shallow in the actual data that they're capturing. It's very, mm-hmm. ma- it's very macro data. Mm-hmm. And what they don't have the ability to say is these are the behaviors that are driving our organizational performance, driving our revenue, driving. You can guess it. You can do the EX surveys. Those are great. Those are poll surveys. Those are great. But, but those are typically multi-item surveys that happen every three to six months, maybe even month, depending on the organization. But it's always what happens between that. That person might have a bad day on that Tuesday that that survey comes out, but a great day on Wednesday when there's no survey there. Right. And so that, that, that consistency of understanding and growing and developing is a critical piece of the human capital market. And I'll kind of I'll end with this where I see what our solution can do, whether it's ours and I hope it's ours. We're trying to create a category uh, and I, I know it will be ours um, is this idea of your soft skills being the objective measure of your leadership, no matter where you go. Mm. Right. This notion of saying, hey, I worked at company A and I want to go work at company B and company B is interviewing me. Hey, company B, here's objective data over the last 6, 12, 18, 24 months 
of my leadership. Is that match your culture? What is your Q change culture score? Well, here are your values that you guys are really strong at using our solution. Right? That's cool. And, and That's so, cool. No, it's, um, you know, here we are, uh, to your point, me- uh, leadership has historically been esoteric and mm. like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a good leader. I got people, you know, following me. And it, it really, if you have this accountability mechanism, whether it be the data or people in your uh, immediate group able to provide that feedback on an ongoing basis, you can see improvement. It's a, I like to call it a de- development continuum. And mm-hmm. it's not to your earlier point too, is point of like a performance metric or it's a development you know, metric. And the idea that it can live on with you and you can take it and showcase it, that's huge. That, that's, that's so wonderful. It's like I'm being seen for you know who I am and that is in and of itself you know validating. So it's, you know, I'm rooting yeah. for you, in other words. Thank you. <laughs> well, even even take it to the different cohorts, right? So, you you know, our cohort, we're young men, maybe late 20s. I'm not sure how old you are. I can't speak, can't speak yeah, for yourself. Yeah, late 20s. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, this generation coming up, millennials and Gen Z, you know, having taught in higher ed for 12 years, I was around this generation. Um, and I can tell you that this is the first generation where their whole entire life, from the minute they got online to today, have had content delivered when they want it, when they need it, and had the ability to give feedback on it when they wanted and when they needed it. Mm-hmm. And so there needs to be a paradigm shift in these organizations of these traditional formats that are important, but shouldn't stand alone because they're not meeting the need of their largest cohort, which by 2026 will be over 60% of their population. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I. that's a great call out because to your point too, just to emphasize it. And I want to ask you one more question before we get to, I got three rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Um, is the immediacy, and we can argue about the appropriateness or ethics of it, but there needs to be arguably some immediacy to retain the attention, particularly of, of younger people. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that something uh, that you mm. just contend in that you're serving as well, that it's not going to be you know, next month that you're going to see feedback, that you're going to see it uh, very quickly, if not in real time? I mean, I, I think you, you really landed on a really important point that I I think gets lost to some of our, we're talking new business with, with potential clients or partners, is that that from a, where consumer psychology really comes into play for me, I think in what we're doing, is that consumer psychology is really about why, when, how, um, you know, someone buys something, when they buy it, how much they buy. And when I think about human capital inside the organization, maybe this is a bit crude, they're buying something. They're buying a culture. They're buying a job. They're buying a leader. How, why, when, how much, how long. And so when you think about that from that perspective, the lens I look through is saying, okay, this cohort clicks on a button, they get what they want. They click on a button and give feedback. They can give a thumbs up. They can give a smiley face, right? This cohort, the immediacy of what they can do is what they know. And like every cohort in every generation, the generation above looks down on them and says, oh, they don't can't pay attention. They can't do this. They can't do that. And what I argue is we should meet them where they're at because they're going to feel more engaged, appreciated, and heard in the flow of work because that's the life they come to work with. So, so I look at it much more from that perspective. Immunity is a great way to look at it. Well, well James, I mean, I, I so appreciate what you're doing. It's like I shared, it's inspiring me to think differently. So last question before the rapid fire questions, uh, the power of the question, your talk, oh. can you speak to what was the inspiration behind that? And yeah. you know, again, we'll put a link so people can view it. So it, uh, the talk that I was referring to is a TED talk, TEDx talk I did in Muscat, Oman. Um, so again, nothing normal for me. So I was in Muscat, Oman, and I did this. And really what it was, it was about that notion of it happened to me, it happened for me. And why that, that evolution of thinking is really critical for someone to get over trauma um, and embrace trauma or embrace negativity or, or their crucible moment. And so that's what the talk was about, was really this idea of saying, hey, here are things that happened to me. I'll give you, I'll give you a really quick story example, life example, which we kind of went over quickly. When I was living at my mom's house, not in my 30s, but in my early 2024s, 20, when I was moving back to Portland to open the ad office, um, I was, um, to say for lack of a better term, stupid. Um, I got a DUI coming, coming to my mom's house from being out. 
And I remember vividly a couple of different things. One, I remember I was like Lewis Hamilton driving down the highway, driving down the road really fast, this little S turn. And I saw these, these lights whip around to chase me. And I was a block from my mom's house. And I thought, Ooh, I bet I can get home and inside before the cop gets there. Right. <laughs> Um, so just to the audience, that's not true. And it doesn't happen that way. Um, and so I pull up to my mom's house in my company car that I had just gotten, I think six weeks prior. And at the time, as I mentioned earlier, my dad passed away. My mom had a new partner and he came out in his first weekend ever staying the night, came out in a white t-shirt and tidy whities What's <laughs> happening? I'm in handcuffs behind in the backseat of the police car. And I'm thinking, oh, sweet Jiminy Christmas. Um, Great impression. But the reason why I tell that story is that I had to go to court mandate outpatient rehab. And it wasn't simple. It was six months of four days a week, three hours a night. And then it was six months of one day a week for three hours. And then it was a year of therapy that I had to go do. And the reason why I bring all that up is that I could have easily at 24 thought, oh, screw this. I'm just going to do it and tick the box and whatever. You know, don't do this to me, da, 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 da. And, and the thought process I had thought process, process I had at that time was, well, if I got to be there, I should get something out of it. I should mm-hmm. learn. I should be a better human being. And it was one of a handful, minus my kids being born and getting married, um, of events where I was like, this is the most impactful thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and I spent... Six months learning about addiction, learning about myself, learning about uh, reflection and self-awareness and self-honesty that you can't replicate until you're forced to do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was one of those moments where I could have said it happened to me and I chose to say it happened for me. And so Mm -hmm. that kind of comes out in the talk, uh, on that TEDx talk that I did. Well, you know, thank you for sharing and you know, thank you, you know, again for, for being you because I see you, know, you wanting to spread that mm-hmm. wisdom, you know, beyond yourself and not just you. you know keep it in. So, you know, again, I'm going to say thank you. All right, my, my rapid fire questions and then we'll wrap. Let's, um, do it, let's do it. Yes, yes, no. Very easy. Um, <laughs> genre of music. What's your favorite genre of music? Oh, God. I'm a super product of the 90s. So I'm like Dave Matthews Band, Jack Johnson, just super chill out stuff. My kids hate it, but I like it. <laughs> no, that's that's chill music. It actually yeah. fits really well, if, if uh, yeah. you don't mind me saying. Um, the other question is inspirations, whether that be books or mm. uh podcasts or something that inspires you of late? Um, you can go back in history too, but I'm thinking more you know, recent. You know, it's not, it's not the something for me. Uh, it's the experience that I'm inspired by. So people's stories, I don't care whose story it is. Um, I'm mm-hmm. inspired by people who have come from hell to be better human beings. And so um, that's always my inspiration for me. And I know that's kind of a vague answer, um, I do listen to podcasts like leadership from the top, the guy Raz one. I listen to the knowledge. Oh gosh, knowledge, something or other. I can't remember the name of it. I'm totally blanking <laughs> out. Um, so it's really meaningful apparently. Um, so, so, you know, but I, I, here's the thing. I, I am a huge, just fan of any interview about someone's life. The actor's guild. I used to listen to that all the time. You know, mm-hmm. like I just think people's journey has so many lessons that you can learn if you listen that you don't necessarily have to repeat, you mm-hmm. know? And so they're, they're just chocker blocked. And that's an Australian term, sorry. Chocker block <laughs> full of just wisdom that in nuggets that are just really impactful. I don't know. I, I think for me, it's just the human story is really inspiring. Well, thank you for sharing your story with yeah. me and us as mm-hmm. a community, because it's, uh, I don't know the word you just used, but there's been so <laughs> you know, block means there's lots of it, like lots of <laughs> learning, lots of, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no apologies yeah. at all. So finally, how can people learn more about you and what you're doing with QChange? So obviously the easiest place to go is um, qchange.com, the letter Q, and then change.com. And you know, for your audience, you know, every organization is different, but our app is free in Microsoft Teams for the first 90 days. So if you can install it there and they haven't blocked it, give it a go, download it, ask your team to help you. Um, and if it's something you like, reach out, we can see if we can make it work. Um, but yeah, the easiest place is just qchange.com. And that's my email is jkelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y at qchange.com.
All right, James. Well, again, thanks for being your awesome self. Super appreciate you sharing. And uh, yeah, I hope we get together in person yeah. before too long. We're starting yeah. to get together, so that'd be good. All right, Thank my friend. Thank you, Al. I appreciate you, well. you too. Thank you for listening today. If you want to learn more about today's guest, go to pafal.net. You'll be able to see links to the bio as well as to the video of today's program. You'll also have the chance to support this podcast and other shows that we do by becoming a Pafal community member. You can also donate if you choose. What will be helpful to support Pafal, the People Data for Good Movement, and me will be to share this episode with friends and coworkers and others who might find it valuable. Finally, for updates on upcoming episodes, shows, and events, please subscribe to our newsletter at pafal.net. At the bottom, you can also see our social media presence. So please subscribe to our company page on LinkedIn. Follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We're active as can be, and we want to provide this content to you that is timely, relevant, and actionable. So again, thank you for listening today and hope to see you soon. I also want to give a shout out to Jenna Dern, Malaz El Sheik, and Sarah Sparnan, who without them, this show would not happen. And now go out and make some great things happen.